Hello there. I'm Dr. Swift Stiles Dickinson of uh, Rockville Campus, Montgomery College. Teach English, literature, composition, and uh, creative writing. And um, <clears throat> I first conceived of the project of travel study to Cuba when I visited the island in 2001 for the International Conference on Caribbean Literature in Havana. Our visit was uh, the first by a U.S. university since 1959, so they told us. Uh, but since that time, numerous U.S. groups have ventured to Cuba, always for educational purposes. During this first venture, I was struck by the possibility of taking a group of Montgomery College students down to study the culture. I understood that we had to approach such a project mindful of the contentious relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. Any travel study arrangement had to be set up with sensitivity toward both countries. But for me, MC students would need to visit this fascinating place in spite of the apparent challenges of doing so. I considered English 102 to be an appropriate course with which to frame the program given its treatment of argument and research. There was and still is an imminent sense that Cuba will change dramatically over the next few years, and I felt that MC should engage in a program studying the country before those changes occur. Another reason for my engagement in the Cuba travel study opportunity comes from my academic background as a Caribbeanist. My PhD focused on the work of two Trinidadian novelists, Sam Selvon and Merle Hodge. So my doctoral work uh, it, it was in the Anglophone Caribbean. However, I have studied Francophone literature as well, and I have always felt that a true Caribbeanist is obliged to become acquainted with at least the French and Spanish Caribbean as well as the English. Hence, I began my foray into Cuban literature as an essential element of Caribbean studies. What follows are five episodes in Cuban history and culture, each illustrative of some aspect of Cuban character. On, on 28 October 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed along the northeastern coast of what he called Kolba, having mistaken the large island for Japan, originally referred to as Chipangu. The admiral, as it is best to call him since his name remains taboo in parts of the Caribbean, found the island to be, quote, the most beautiful that eyes have ever seen with good harbors and deep rivers, end quote. Some canoes came out to greet him, but when the paddlers saw that his ship was seeking anchorage, they turned back. Soon enough, the admiral learned of possible riches to be had, and so began the history of an encounter that changed the world. Later in 1511, Bartolomé de las Casas, a Dominican friar who denounced Spanish atrocities, visited upon indigenous people of the Americas, related a story about the brave chief Atue, who was captured by Spaniards in Cuba. What has become mythical is his resistance and martyrdom. As Atue was tied to a stake and threatened with being burned alive, a Franciscan friar assured him that he would go to hell unless he accepted the Christian faith, whereupon he would be admitted into heaven. Atue asked the friar if Christians would be in that heaven too, and the friar answered in the affirmative. At that, Atue said he'd rather go to hell and they could proceed to burn him. In his example, we see the powerful resistance of the indigenous people on the island, and although these people were killed off by overwork and disease, their spirit remains on the island. Ultimately, Atue became a beer, kind of lager, so much for his particular martyrdom, unfortunately. Another voice of the island can be found in the national poet Nicolas Guillén, born in Camagüey in 1902. In his powerful Cuban elegy, Guillén treats the problematic relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. Cuba, sold out palm grove, drawn and quartered dream, tough map of sugar and neglect. Right next door our neighbor is seen, who has the phone and submarine. He has a barbarous fleet. He has a mountain of gold, the penthouse, and chorus bold of eagles, soldiers by the score, who, blind and deaf, are led to war by hate and fear. These are harsh words, and yet we bear the obligation to reconsider U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis our neighbor lying a mere 90 miles to the south. As Cuban dissident Elizardo Sanchez Santa Cruz argues, Cubans, quote, yearn for peace, prosperity, and freedom, and American policy impedes the transformation we seek. Santa Cruz admits that the existing totalitarian state in Cuba is obsolete and inefficient. 
and must evolve into a more open system that is better attuned to the global economy. But he also insists that such a transition must occur peacefully, urging Washington to lift all restrictions on travel to Cuba by, by Americans and to dissolve the embargo on sale sales of food and medicine to Cuba, a prohibition that violates international law and hurts the people, not the regime." End quote. This presents a complex issue as one demands that the Castros do their part to permit the free expression of ideas on the island. But the U.S. is clearly in a position to mitigate the harsh living conditions as well. Ultimately, Santa Cruz concludes that the responsibility for Cuba's future rests with the Cubans themselves.